never want to lose your love I never want to let you down In wilderness we won't give up This lecture is the first of our unit on fields. And I want to start by recalling a bunch of examples of fields and basic properties of fields that we've seen already, for example, in our study of rings and vector spaces, that will be useful as we dive more deeply into the theory of fields. So let's first just talk about some examples of fields. Some examples that come up frequently are Q, R, C. We saw also an example in section 7.1, this is example five, where you take any square free integer D and you can look at Q adjoined square root of D, which is the set of all things of the form A plus B times the square root of D, where A and B are rational numbers. So one thing that's not obvious right away is that this actually is a field, that every element a plus b square root of d actually has an inverse in uh, an inverse that's of this form, a multiplicative inverse. And how do we prove that? We can prove that by just writing one down. So what is a plus b square root of d inverse? Well, it's a minus b times the square root of d divided by a plus b times the square root of d times a minus b times the square root of d, right? Because the a minus b square root of d is cancel, so it's 1 over a plus b square root of d. And now the denominator becomes a squared minus d b squared. And we know this isn't 0 because d is uh, square free. This is a square free integer. Don't take 1 because uh, then you just get q. So OK, so we have this a minus b square root of d divided by this rational number. All right, and why is that of the form a plus b square root of d for some other you know, two rational numbers? Well, it's a over a squared minus d b squared, which is some rational number, plus negative b over a squared minus d b squared times square root of d. And this is some other rational number. So we've seen that every element has a multiplicative inverse by actually writing down what that inverse is. So Q adjoint square root of D, uh, we can compare to C, which is everything of the form A plus B I, where A and B are in R. So it looks kind of similar. It's like uh, you have some special element here, square root of D. Here it's I, the square root of negative 1. And you're taking all linear combinations of 1 and that one special element where your coefficients are in your original field, either Q or R. So. What I want to emphasize is C, thought of in this way, looks a lot like R join I in analogy with this construction here, A plus B I, where A and B are in R. So I is not in R in the same way that square root of D is not in Q. So we're going to make this uh, sort of vague analogy more formal uh, coming up, especially in the next lecture. So what are other examples of fields that we've seen? Finite fields. Well, one finite field we've seen is Z mod PZ, which is a finite field of P elements, so we often write FP. But this isn't all of the ones we've seen. So one big idea is we're going to think about fields in terms of quotients of polynomial rings by maximal ideals. So we saw in section 9.5 in our study of polynomial rings that if F is a field and little f of x is a polynomial in F bracket x, then the quotient of f of x by the ideal generated by this polynomial little f is a field if and only if f of x is irreducible. The key thing is that f bracket x is a Euclidean domain. It's a PID. Uh, irreducible elements are prime, and prime ideals are maximal. All right, so what else do we know about this quotient? Well, uh, f bracket x is a vector space over f. The ideal generated by f of x is also a vector space over f. This quotient vector space is also a vector space over f. And the dimension is equal to the degree of this polynomial f. Let's call that n. We can ask for a basis of this vector space. And one way to describe a basis is something we've seen already in our discussion of vector spaces. We have this natural projection homomorphism from f bracket x to this quotient. And we can look at the image of x under this projection. So this pi of x, we're going to write as x bar. That's a common thing to do where you put a bar over something for the image under a natural projection homomorphism. And what is that? That's the coset 
of the ideal generated by uh, f of x. Oh, I guess I want this to be here. Uh, the coset of the ideal generated by f of x in this polynomial ring uh, that x is in, the coset containing x of this ideal. OK, so with this notation set up, we know that the image of 1 x x squared up to x to the n minus 1, this is a basis for this quotient vector space, which is actually a field when f is an irreducible polynomial. Uh, also, just thinking about um, the fact that the natural projection map is actually a homomorphism, pi of x squared is pi of x times pi of x. So uh, x squared bar is x bar times x bar, where you think of x bar as an element of this quotient. So you could say another way that 1, this really is the identity over here on the right side, x, x squared up to x to the n minus 1, where now I'm just not saying the bar anymore. This is a basis for this vector space. And this is something we'll talk about more uh, in the next lecture. But uh, OK, so if we're in this situation where we have a finite field, let's say that f is fp. So if you have this polynomial little f of x in fp bracket x, and it's irreducible of degree n, then this quotient is a field. And it's a vector space over fp of dimension n. So how many elements does it have? It has p to the n elements. So this quotient is a finite field of order p to the n. All right, so I'm going to pause and erase, and then I'll recall some other things that we know about fields. For example, uh, recall some things about the characteristic of a ring and the characteristic of a field. Let's next recall something about the field of fractions of an integral domain. So if R is an integral domain, in section 7.5 at the very beginning of Math 206b, we discussed this procedure of taking a multiplicatively closed subset of R that doesn't contain any zero divisors and uh, or zero, and using that to create the ring of fractions of R with respect to that subset D. In the case that R is an integral domain, we can take D to be all the non-zero elements of R, and we get this ring of fractions D inverse R, which is actually a field. This is the field of fractions of R. What do the elements look like? They're equivalence classes of pairs, R comma D, where R is in the ring and D is in this multiplicatively closed subset uh, D, which in this case is just all the non-zero elements of R. So this is something we discussed following uh, theorem 15 in section 7.5, which was the big theorem of this section. One example that we talked about a little bit was when you take R to be the polynomial ring F bracket X, where F is a field. So you do this process, and what is the field of fractions? You get F adjoin X, the field of rational functions in X over the field F. And what do the elements look like? They look like quotients of polynomials, P of X, Q of X, where Q of X has to be non-zero. So this is a kind of example that we'll talk about in our discussion of fields. So I wanted to recall the basic construction. So now I want to recall something else that we talked about uh, in the first homework assignment of Math 206B. So this is exercise 26 of section 7.3, Math 206B homework one. This is something we saw. We define the characteristic of a ring R to be the smallest positive integer n such that you take the multiplicative identity, you add it to itself n times, and you get zero in R. OK, so this uh, definition supposes that R is a ring with a multiplicative identity. Let's assume that. Uh, OK, and what if no such positive integer exists? Then we say that the characteristic of R is 0. So just to give some basic examples, Z mod PZ has characteristic P. More generally, Z mod NZ has characteristic N. And so does Z mod NZ bracket X for any N. So you take any polynomial with coefficients in Z mod NZ. Uh, or yeah, you take the identity in Z mod NZ bracket X, which is a polynomial of degree 0, 1. You add it to itself n times, and you get 0, because that's how addition works in Z mod NZ. And some uh, examples with characteristic 0, Q, R, C. If you take 1 in any one of these 
fields and you add it to itself n times, you're never coming back around to get zero. OK, so uh, this is this definition. Here are some examples. And one of the things you prove in this exercise is you have this map from z to r defined by, let's send k to, if k is a positive integer, we'll take the identity of r and add it to itself k times. k is 0, we send 0 and z to the 0 element in r. And if k is a negative integer, we take uh, the negative, the in additive inverse of the identity in r, and we add that to itself k times. And you show that this is a ring homomorphism, and that the kernel is nz, where n is the characteristic of r. OK, so I'm going to pause and erase, and then I'll talk about uh, some more uh, things that we can do with this. Another part of this exercise concerns the case where uh, p is prime and r has characteristic p. You show using the binomial theorem that a plus b to the p power is a to the p plus b to the p in R. And I'm not bringing this up now because we need it for our discussion of fields that's coming up. But this actually ends up being really useful on one of your problems on homework number two, where you uh, end up considering the factorization of some polynomial x to the p minus 1 in fp bracket x. And one little trick is to think of x to the p minus 1 as x to the p minus 1 to the p or x to the p plus minus 1 to the p when uh, p is odd anyway. And you can write this now as x minus 1 to the p. OK, so uh, building on that exercise from homework 1 of Math 206b, there's another exercise from homework 1 of Math 206b, number 28 in section 7.3 that, that we also did which says that the characteristic of an integral domain R is either some prime P or is 0. And the idea is if you have two positive integers, A and B, A times B times 1. So 1 added to itself A times B times, where you add negative 1 instead if A times B is negative, is the product of A times 1 times B times 1 in this uh, ring R, just by the distributive property. So you can use this to see that uh, in an integral domain where you don't have zero divisors, uh, the characteristic is either going to be prime or is zero. OK, so you can see a full uh, proof of this in section 13.1, where proposition 1 says this specialized to the case of fields. So the characteristic of a field f denoted chf is either a prime p or is zero. And it says a little more. It says, in the case that the characteristic of f is prime, then for any alpha in f, if you take uh, p times alpha, which is, what does that mean? It's alpha plus alpha plus alpha plus alpha p times. Well, that's p times 1 times alpha, where this means 1 times alpha plus 1 times alpha p times, which is the integer p times 1 times alpha, which the integer p times 1 is uh, or sorry, this is, um, yeah, sorry. So I said this wrong. So this is p times alpha. It's alpha plus alpha plus alpha p times. This is p times 1 times alpha in f. So this is the identity in f. Uh, Devin and Foot often write this 1 with a little sub f here. So it, it clarifies um, what exactly these things are. This is the multiplicative identity of f times alpha, right? That's just alpha. and. Uh, by the distributive property, this should be uh, p times 1 times f. So it's the multiplicative identity added to itself, p times, times alpha. This is some element of f. This is some element of f. And this element is 0 because f has characteristic p. So this is 0 times alpha, which is 0 in f. So in conclusion, what I, I should have said, the quick thing to remember is just that you take any element alpha in f, you add it to itself p times, and you get 0, no matter what alpha you start with. So one other fact that I want to recall is that uh, the characteristic of an integral domain r is the same as the characteristic of its field of fractions. And uh, this is something that I'll leave you to think about the details of a formal proof. But the idea is just if you take some element r and you add it to itself 
a bunch of times, you can compare what happens when you take an element in the field of fractions, which is some fraction r over d, and you add it to itself a bunch of times. You have this common denominator, and you get r plus r plus r in the numerator here. So if you take uh, r equals 1, and like that'll give you the, um, the particular case here where you're seeing the characteristic. And what is 1 in the field of fractions? You just take any element in d, and you take the class d over d. So I'll let you think about uh, the details here. But in general, the characteristic of an integral domain is the same as the characteristic of its field of fractions. All right, so I'll pause and erase. And I'll just say a little more about the characteristic and mention one other exercise that we already solved in Math 206b. Let's now go back to this map from z to our field f that we described earlier that we get by taking the integer n to n times the identity, multiplicative identity of f, where this is 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times, if n is positive, 0, or it's minus 1 plus minus 1 plus minus 1 uh, minus n times when n is negative. So this is a homomorphism. And we can take the quotient by the kernel. And the kernel, we know, is the ideal in z generated by uh, the characteristic of f. This explains why we say characteristic 0. Right? If the, the kernel is trivial, then it's generated by the ideal, or it's the ideal generated by the zero element. And now we can apply the first isomorphism theorem and see that the image is isomorphic to the quotient of z by this ideal generated by the kernel of f. And the image is a subring of uh, f. So what does that mean? Uh, f contains either a subfield isomorphic to fp in the case that the characteristic is a prime integer, or it contains a subring isomorphic to z. So it either has uh, the image is a field in the case that uh, the characteristic of f is prime, so um, f contains this subfield isomorphic to fp, or when the kernel is trivial, the image of this map gives a subring isomorphic to z inside of f. But f is a field. So if we have this subring inside of f, we also contain the subfield generated by that subring. So in the second case, it contains a subfield isomorphic to the field of fractions of z, which is q. So this is something uh, that we talked about when we talked about rings of fractions and the subfield generated by a subset inside of a field. OK, so what is this field? By this field, I mean. Uh, the one that comes from this process, the image of this map, uh, well, it's uh, this field that's either fp in the first case when the characteristic is prime, or this copy of q in the second case when the characteristic is 0. This is the smallest subfield of f containing the multiplicative identity of f. This is the subfield generated by this element, the multiplicative identity of f. So this gets a special name. This is called the prime subfield of f. It's a subfield of f generated by the multiplicative identity. And it's isomorphic to fp if the characteristic of f is p, and it's q if the characteristic of f is 0. And this whole discussion is review. This is basically exercise 3 in section 7.5. It's almost exactly uh, this statement phrased in a slightly different way. And this was also on homework 1 of math 206b. So in this first video, what have we done? We've recalled a bunch of things from Math 206b that uh, will be helpful in our study of fields.